When you start collecting Imperial Guard, picking which regiment you're going to play is one of the biggest decisions you can make. Hopefully this video will help you make this decision. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. In this video we'll be going over a good number of Imperial Guard regiments, including the main age from the Guard Codex, and also Death Corps and Elysians, which are produced by Forge World. We'll quickly talk over each regiment's lore and how they take to the battlefield, talk over their current miniature range from Games Workshop should they have one, and how they currently play on the tabletop. So without further ado, let's get started with the Cadians. The Cadian Shock Troops are possibly the most widely known regiment in the galaxy. Hailing from the now fallen fortress world of Cadia, this highly disciplined regiment stood watch over the forces of chaos for millennia, keeping the horrors of the Eye of Terror at bay. Every single inhabitant of Cadia was a member of the Imperial Guard, automatically conscripted at birth and employed by the military forces in whatever fashion would best serve the good of the defence. By the age of five, most Cadians could assemble and field strip a last rifle, and by adulthood they're well trained in every field of war including vehicular combat. Such was the sheer quantity of fine regiments that Cadia produced that their regiments are deployed to all segments in the galaxy, and their prowess has caused many other regiments to ape them in terms of gear and training. The Catechin Elites are the stormtroopers of Cadia, and one of the best fighting forces of the Imperial Guard, and stand as equals to the Militarum Tempestus Scions. During the 13th Black Crusade, Abaddon the Despoiler unleashed uncounted hordes of warp-spawn cultists and chaos marines on the planet, and following the cataclysmic defence and offence, Cadia itself was destroyed when Abaddon crashed his crippled Blackstone Fortress, Pillar of Eternity, into the planet, decimating it utterly and allowing the forces of Chaos to spill out past the Eye of Terror, forming the Cicatrix Maledictum that splits the Imperium. Despite being bereft of a homeworld, the many Akkadian regiments across the galaxy fight with renewed vigour to hold back the tide of Chaos and fight for the glory of their fallen homeworld. In terms of their miniatures, Cadians are one of the best supported kits by Games Workshop, having the most representation in plastic and a few notable special characters, including Creed, Kel, and Knight Commander Pask. Their trusty box of shock troops is quite an old one, and it is looking a little bit dated these days, but they do have the advantage of being relatively cheap, with easy build Cadian Guardsmen being available, cheaper than any of the other sorts, and the various vehicle crew miniatures and other guard miniatures in general tending to most resemble Cadians rather than any of the other regiments. Typically, if there are any big value boxes going as well, they will typically be for the Cadians. Gameplay wise, the Cadians are a combined arms gunline faction for the most part, with their benefits being around fire support, with their regimental doctrine and stratagem overlapping fields of fire, providing decent buffs to the firepower of infantry, tanks and artillery. They're one of the strongest guard regiments out there at the moment, and they're reasonably easy to use for newer players. In addition, their Relic of Lost Cadia provides a massive boost against the forces of chaos and can be handy for meeting out a decent amount of payback for destroying their poor homeworld. In their hearts, Cadia still stands. Next we have some Kaschan jungle fighters. This regiment is drawn from the death world of Kaschan, a hellish jungle world where almost every form of life is carnivorous and could happily kill an unprepared human being. It's only via brutal strength and incredible practicality that you can survive in such an environment, meaning that the men and women of Kaschan are notoriously hardy and throughout generations of survival have become increasingly stronger and even more muscle bound. This truly impressive physique means that the men of Kaschan are frankly terrifying adversaries in close combat and ideal shock troops for the Imperium of Man. Notable Kaschans include the one-man army Sly Marbo, Gunnery Sergeant Harker, and Colonel Ironhand Strachan, a grizzled veteran even among the standards of the hardy Kaschans. Kaschan culture still maintains strong tribal traditions, and many of the regiment's officers are elected, and are therefore highly trusted to lead them into battle. As a partial byproduct of this, Kaschan regiments are very infrequently accompanied by commissars, and it's not uncommon for certain commissars who join regiments and try and lord it over their Kaschan subordinates to go missing or suffer certain unpleasant accidents. When the regiment makes war off-world, Kaschans are notably famed for their close combat, bearing long blades and brutal knives in addition to their las guns and bayonets. Veteran teams make frequent use of shotguns, demo charges and flamers, and among vehicles, high explosives and hellhound tanks are the preferred weapons of choice. In terms of miniatures, Kaschan are the other major range of plastic miniatures that are supported for the guard by Games Workshop, though I'd say a little bit less so than the Cadians, and the vehicle crews don't tend to fit in with the aesthetic quite as well, not being quite as muscle-bound. The standard Kaschan Jungle Fighters box hasn't aged particularly well compared with some others, but more recent plastics for them, such as the Command Squad, really do quite well, and manage to pull off the muscle-bound look without looking quite as goofy-looking as some of the standard squads. 
being available in plastic, again, they're one of the cheapest regiments, although I'd say not quite as cheap as the Cadence, not having the monopose easy build miniatures to bulk out their main battle line, and not being present in quite as many of the big value kits that Games Workshop occasionally puts on offer. Gameplay wise, as you'd expect, they're pretty brutal in close combat, with your standard infantry squads being far happier to tangle with the foe than most guard are up close and personal in 40k. Their vehicles are also particularly powerful with high explosives and flame weapons, and are arguably one of the strongest regiments out there at the moment, if not the strongest. It's hard to argue with very decent vehicle firepower, combined with very strong infantry melee when you have Strachan and a Ministorum Priest about. Next we come to the Vostroyan Firstborn, a regiment hailing from the industrial hive world of Vostroya. The regiments that hail from Vostroya are somewhat unique, in that they are part of a punishment placed on the planet for refusing to send men to help in the fight against the Warmaster Horus during his great uprising in the Horus Heresy. In the aftermath of this apocalyptic conflict, the Lords of the Imperium placed the yoke upon Vostroya that every family would give their firstborn son to service in the Imperial Guard. Once in a generation, the Vostroyans dispatched their regiment of firstborn sons to reinforce the Vostroyan regiments out in the galaxy, never more to return to their homeworld. Unusually, rather than exclusively raising new regiments, they do reinforce the ones they already have out in the galaxy, meaning that unless utterly destroyed, each Vostroyan regiment has a long history of noble deeds and equipment that may go back as far as the Horus Heresy itself. It's not uncommon for Vostroyan soldiers to be fighting with heirloom weapons that are many times more valuable than the soldier who bears them. As Vostroy is a manufacturing and industrial world mainly devoted to the Deptus Mechanicum, their regiments tend to be better equipped than most. Many of their rank and file are equipped with carapace armour, and they typically march to war under the Vostroyan colours of red and brass. Since the opening of the Cicatrix Maledictum, the great warp storm that splits the Imperium in two, the Vostroyans have become cut off from the Emperor's light, and many of their transports aiming to reinforce the regiments never make it to their destination, being lost in the horrors of the Immaterium between the stars. Nevertheless, the men of Vostroya still venture out into the night, never faltering in the repayment of their homeworld's debt. In terms of their miniatures, unfortunately they're a metal range that Games Workshop no longer produces as standards. They were discontinued around about a year or so ago, and they did come back briefly as a made-to-order range, which Games Workshop seems to do semi-regularly with the guard regiments, but if you actually want the official Games Workshop miniatures, then eBay or second-hand is the only real way. Otherwise, there are plenty of third-party miniature makers that provide some excellent not fosterons, things like Anvil Industries or Victoria miniatures, where you can buy entire models, or occasionally just things like heads and woolly hats, and other upgrades to give your men a Vostroyan theme. This will probably be the cheapest way. If you do want to buy the metal miniatures off eBay or secondhand, then they are likely to cost you a pretty penny due to the scarcity of them being available. I'm certain recasters will also be jumping on the bandwagon, particularly as Games Workshop doesn't sell the products anymore. And though it's still technically IP theft, it's a bit more of a grey area if recasters are actually selling something that isn't actually being sold by the company anymore, as you can't really say that they're competing with sales all that much. Gameplay wise, the Vostroyans have extra range on all of their weapons to represent the heirloom weapons and fine craft of their homeworld. This makes them particularly good at mid-range firefights with infantry las rifles and plasma guns, and the regiment's very strong indeed with things like Lehman Rust demolishers and punisher cannons who really like that bit of extra range. They're certainly one of the stronger guard regiments, although they're a little bit more niche than Cadian and Kastchan. Also their firstborn prize stratagem can really help out any one tank or vehicle in your army, giving it plus one to hit and making it extra devastating for a turn. It's particularly nice on big things like super heavies and bane blades. Next up we're moving on to the Talarn Desert Raiders, a regiment with a definite Middle Eastern feel going on. Talarn used to be a verdant agri world that was devastated early in the history of the Imperium, where during the Horus Heresy it was virus bombed by the Iron Warriors Traitor Legion. These munitions scoured most of the life from the planet, leaving the once green world a barren desert, with only small scraps of civilization hanging on to existence. Despite the horrors inflicted on them, the Talon people rose to the occasion, mastering the armoured guerrilla warfare tactics that would become their want to brutally engage and destroy enemy armour before vanishing again amidst the dunes. What would come to be known as the Battle of Talon would be the single largest tank battle in the entire history of the galaxy. The Iron Warriors, brutalised and stymied at every turn, withdrew from the planet, deeming it too costly to take, allowing the people of Talarn to rebuild and rearm. To this day, the people of Talarn remain masters of mobility and open desert warfare. Often their infantry formations are mounted upon Rough Rider cavalry, sometimes fighting from horseback, sometimes dismounting to fight on foot when the enemy comes near. The Talarn tank regiments have recently been fighting alongside Rebute Gilliman's Indomitus Crusade, their swift and uncompromising strikes harrying the enemy supply line and winning battles on other fronts, while the Primaris Marines surge ever onwards. One notable Talon commander
commander is Captain Aurahem of the Talon III, also known as the Desert Tigers. Aurahem exemplifies the Talon way of war, pragmatically advancing and withdrawing as the flows of battle dictate, ever manoeuvring and seeking new opportunities to outflank the foe. Much like the Vostroians, the Talon are one of the metal regiments that Games Workshop discontinued in relatively recent history. Even when they were supported, they were one of the less well-represented metal ranges, with fewer sculpts than some of the others. So as before, it's going to be third-party miniatures, or expensive second-hand miniatures online. In the game at the moment, the Talon are certainly an interesting army to play, and are one of the best choices for a large amount of the guard motor pool. Their tank commanders are particularly interesting, being able to move, shoot, and then move again, to hopefully hit the enemy while being able to stay safe with their unique tank order. Models like Sentinels and their artillery can achieve surprising mobility while keeping up an admirable weight of fire, and their unique stratagem can allow a whole bunch of them to outflank, hopefully surprising the foe by turning up behind them. If you like being able to flexibly redeploy your guardsmen, then Talon is probably the regiment for you. All this equates to them being fairly strong, maybe not as generically all-round strong as Cadian and Kastchan, but certainly a very solid choice for a lot of the guard vehicles. Next we come to the fighting men of the Armageddon Steel Legion. These are drawn from the sprawling hive worlds of the linchpin sector world of Armageddon, a world with enormous population and enormous industrial capacity, such as the level of industry and population that the wastes between the hives are a deadly ash zone strewn with toxic chemicals. Due to its importance, Armageddon has become the site of three enormous battles throughout the history of the Imperium, where it has fought off the forces of chaos and twice been assailed by the orc war boss Gaskell Thracker, leading some of the biggest invasions of greenskins the galaxy has ever seen. Due to the well supplied industry of their homeworld, a very large proportion of the Armageddon Steel Legion are issued with Chimera or Torox transports, allowing for rapid redeployment throughout the inimical environment of the Armageddon Ash Wastes. Men of the Steel Legions are often drawn from underhive gangs, where the Imperial Guard puts their martial savagery and natural cunning to good use in defence of mankind. The traditional equipment of the Guardsmen includes a mustard yellow greatcoat, a rounded bowl helmet and a gas mask to allow them to fight no matter how toxic the environment. Due to their repeated conflicts with the Orcs, these are a particularly favoured foe of the Steel Legion and are well placed to foil the predictable savagery and cunning tricks that Orc war bosses might seek to employ against them. In terms of miniatures, the Steel Legion are another army that only have metal sculpts, and again most of them were discontinued, but Games Workshop has chosen to carry on selling the standard Steel Legion squad. The one that you can see here that's armed with a missile launcher. I think that the sculpts have aged quite well, they've definitely got a bit of a World War II German feel to them, between the great coats and helmets. Interestingly enough, this standard box of Steel Legion has now almost got to the point where the plastic miniatures are as expensive as it, it's only very slightly more expensive than cast channel Cadian models. Though of course you don't get the flexibility that you get with plastic kits, and they are limited to the poses that are available here. Other models do exist, again in the hands of second-hand sellers, and third-party miniatures do very much try and fill the gap. They aren't so dissimilar to the Death Corps of Krieg either, though using their resin models to stand in would certainly be a very expensive alternative. In game, the Steel Legion tend to revolve around their mechanised warfare, as you'd expect, with vehicles that are slightly more durable against certain weapons, and their infantry excelling in medium-range rapid-fire firefights. Their unique order also allows them to shoot and then escape back into one of these tanks, which can give them a little bit of a leg up compared with some other regiments applying this tactic. Overall though, mechanised infantry isn't usually the strongest way to play guard at the moment, unfortunately. Their vehicle defence buff is pretty situational, only applying to AP-1 weapons, and the buff to infantry only affects certain weapons, such as the standard Lias rifle and plasma guns. Certainly usable, but one of the slightly weaker regiments out there at the moment. Next we come on to the Valhallen Ice Warriors. These grim and unwavering winter specialists are highly reminiscent of World War II Soviet forces. Their homeworld of Valhalla was unfortunately struck by a comet, knocking the once verdant world off its axis and turning it into a frozen icy hellscape. This cataclysm was followed shortly by a large orc invasion, yet despite the odds and a much reduced populace that had suffered horribly due to the environmental collapse, the people of Valhallen chose not to surrender, but instead brutally pushed back against the greenskin menace until their planet was cleansed of the orcish threat. Valhallen measurements are famed for their stubborn refusal to give up, or even take a step back and retreat, even should the situation seem absolutely hopeless. Enemy commanders will often be surprised in having to exterminate Valhallen formations down to the very last man, as the shattered remnants of squads continue to make their presence felt in suicidal attacks against a far superior foe. When on the offensive, Valhallens typically combine huge waves of infantry advancing with pounding artillery barrages. The men, often conscripts, are far more afraid of the commissar's displeasure than they could ever be of a death in combat against the foe. 
One of the most well-known Valhallans is Commander Kubrick Chenkov, who is famed for the callous disregard for the lives of his own men, playing the simple numbers game of overwhelming enemy positions in wave after wave of guardsmen until total victory is achieved. Though somewhat simple tactics, they certainly prove to be very effective and can deliver quick victories and end threats before they truly get going, albeit at a brutal cost in Valhallan lives. Again, sadly, this metal range is very much discontinued by Games Workshop, although they have very recently been available as made-to-order kits, perhaps meaning that there should be a fair few more out there than normal, and perhaps second-hand prices might be a little bit lower than they might otherwise have been. They certainly look very striking in their great coats. they are showing their age a little bit, but perhaps less so than some of the ranges. Again, third-party miniatures are available to represent these guys, and if you are willing to do some conversion work, you could potentially convert from Deathcore 412 miniatures, or perhaps even the Armageddon Steel Legion, although that will be very difficult as they are made of metal. Not the easiest all in all. Gameplay-wise, Valhalla infantry won't run away nearly as frequently as their other counterparts, meaning that actually for infantry formations the army is quite a bit more durable, as morale can be a significant factor in how many men that you lose in the guard. They have a great relic called Petrov's Mark 45, which can make conscript hordes fearless, and it's one of the best ways to play this style of guard. Their tanks also echo this resoluteness, and even when they're damaged they'll still be firing at decent capacity. Overall, I don't think that they quite compete as well with Kadeen or Kaschan, but they do have their own unique playstyle in doing conscript hordes pretty much better than anyone else. Next we move on to the Militarum Tempestus Scions. These are more of a subset of the Imperial Guard rather than a regiment in their own right, and their organisation comprises of a whole bunch of distinct regiments, each with their own colours and heraldry. Also known as Stormtroopers, this elite mechanised infantry formation are raised from birth as orphans in the Scholar Progenium. Life in the school is strict and the training regime harsh, but the Imperium is expending significant resources in making these men into the apex of what humans can achieve while not being augmented to space marine levels. Sounds learn to be utterly devoted to the Imperium, are taught battlefield tactics and strategy on a level far above the average guardsman, and are equipped with far superior weapons such as carapace armour, hotshot lasguns and grav shoots to be deployed as commandos to support more traditional Imperial Guard formations. Many more unique forces of stormtroopers exist throughout the Imperium, including the Cadian Kazakin, Inquisitorial Stormtroopers, Death Corps Grenadiers, and Steel Legion Stormtroopers. This superior treatment and gear certainly sets them apart from their standard guard regiments, who often refer to them by such names such as Glory Boys or Big Toy Soldiers, though they generally tend to be grateful when the Scion squads are deployed to key points in battles to try and turn the tide against the enemy. In battle, they are often deployed from Valkyrie gunships or the upgunned Tarox Prime and used by generals as a fast reactive blaze to counter strikes by the enemy or cut deep into enemy lines for specific missions. These soldiers are the best that the Astra Militarum can provide and are thus constantly in short supply. Miniatures wise, the Tempestus Sounds have the most recent guard kit of any of the regiments on this list. Their kit's pretty detailed and very flexible, allowing you to customise the Sounds to arm them with various special weapons and alter some poses, which a lot of the metal kits or even the standard Cadian Castions don't do quite as much. Basically, the entire range is just this one plastic kit though, which can also build their command squad and also Tempesta Primes, their leaders. In addition to Commissars, Valkyries, and Torox Primes, this is basically their entire army. So if you are just wanting to use Militarum Tempestus, and you are limiting yourself to a fairly small pool out of the guard range. It is worth noting that the old Kazakhin stormtroopers are often still kicking around on eBay, though they are going very expensive these days, as people have a lot of love for these old miniatures, as not everyone was the biggest fan of this new slightly baroque aesthetic, but personally I think they're pretty cool myself. Price-wise, they're perhaps a little bit more expensive than your standard guardsmen, particularly as per box you only get 5 sounds in the box, and they don't cost all that many points these days. However, they do have a decent start collecting kit, which gives you two of these boxes and a Commissar and a Torox Prime at a reasonable discount compared with buying them separately, so this is fairly helpful for getting going. Gameplay-wise, they had their options massively expanded in the new Psychic Awakening book, allowing you to fill different Sion regiments with different flavours, but they generally involve dropping in out of the sky from grav shoot insertion and obliterating key targets with special weapons. Some tactics they can employ make heavy use of their Valkyries or Tarox Primes, so there are a couple of different slight flavours of how you can run Sions. Currently, since this latest boost, they've got a little bit more powerful, although I do think that they are strongest as an allied faction to a main guard army, as opposed to trying to make the entire army Militarum Tempestus. The guys coming in from reserve as a scalpel to take down key units are pretty powerful, but they struggle a little bit more if they're just trying to fight a land war all by themselves, where the standard guard infantry and tanks will generally do a bit better. 
Next up, we come to the Mordians. The Mordian Iron Guard hail from the disturbingly overpopulated night world of Mordian and are famed for their impeccable military dress and perfect coordination on the battlefield, moving around as blocks and opening fire on the enemy with devastating fusillades. The world of Mordian is tidally locked, with one side of its planet permanently scorched by the radiation of its star, forcing the planet's entire population to dwell on the night side where they endure very cramped living conditions amongst the spires and underground warrens of its hive cities. The Tetrarchy that rules Mordian does so with an iron fist, drilling its guardsmen until they perform their duties with perfect precision and disturbing near-mechanical motions. This paranoia and focus on control come from the Battle of Mordian, where the unhappy population rose up against the rulers, attempting to destroy the planet's government in the name of chaos. After a foul ritual was completed in the sewers of Mordian, the rebellion was aided from help from the void, the force of chaos descending on the planet to press the stretched Iron Guard yet further. Despite slaying many times their own number of the mutant horde, the Iron Guard would press steadily back, drawing themselves up for one last final defence of the palace complex of the planet's rulers. Just as it was looking as if they were about to be overrun, the rituals and spells that kept the demons in real space faded away, the energies of the Chaos Psychers utterly spent. Demoralised at the loss of their demonic allies, the rebels were driven back in disarray, and the Mordian Iron Guard patrolled the streets, brutally and efficiently restoring order to their shattered planet. In the 41st millennium, the Great Rift has opened and Mordian is assailed afresh from horrors from the sky. Upon seeing the brash heraldry of the Mordians, many an enemy general has been caught unawares, expecting that they're fighting an impractical military, only to be brutally driven back by the efficient Mordian gunline. Again, in terms of models, the Mordians are another metal discontinued range. Their sculpts definitely have a bit more of a 90s feel to them, showing their age just a little bit more than some of the others, I feel. I feel the regiment definitely has a dress uniform slash Prussians in space sort of theme. And as per normal at this point, there are plenty of other miniature companies that provide similar aesthetic miniatures. In game, the Mordians get a benefit of leadership when they're all ranked up next to each other, which I think is quite a fun and fluffy little rule that means your Mordians can fight in close formation and gain some benefit from moving around as blocks as you might expect them to do on a parade ground. They're extra good at repelling the enemy when charging, having decent overwatch which hits a bit better than normal but this is quite a situational benefit that only helps against some armies and not massively against those ones, as Overwatch is a mechanic that has quite a lot of ways that can easily counter it, and unfortunately their stratagem, which used to be very powerful, was edited by Games Workshop to be now really quite tame. Next we come to the Elysian Drop Troops, whose regiments are famed for the extensive use of aircraft and elite soldiers descending from grav chutes directly into the heart of battle. Elysia is a verdant and civilised world, in a sector that has a significant pirate and raider problem. Each Elysian Drop Trooper must perform a tour of duty defending his homeworld before he is considered for selection for the Imperial Guard, such as Elysian's pressing need for good planetary defence and rapid strike forces to be able to take the fight to the pirates and raiders should they become too much of a problem. Drop troop regiments are an absolute rarity in the Imperial Guard, compared with the far more common tank, infantry and artillery detachments. Elysians are therefore granted somewhat elite status and are in high demand by the Imperium's generals. It can be an awe-inspiring sight seeing an entire regiment of drop troopers deployed by Valkyrie insertion, with thousands of men and women grav shooting in to take the fight to the enemy on an entirely unexpected front. And Elysian commanders are somewhat known for their unorthodox and rapid daring strike tactics, which they have honed dealing with pirate incursions on their homeworld. These rapid deployment and airborne tactics do have their downsides though, they're very rarely supported by decent armor or heavy weapons support, aside from what their Valkyries can muster, meaning that the regiment can be somewhat vulnerable once it is fully deployed. In terms of miniatures, unfortunately Elysians are another discontinued regiment, originally made in resin by Forgeworld, but again sadly no longer supported. Compared with other regiments, they have even fewer available second hands due to expensive Forgeworld resin, meaning that they weren't particularly prevalent before they were discontinued. So generally the best way to go about making some is going to be to convert some, as aside from some slightly different heads, grav shoots and rifles, they're not a million miles away from the bog standard Cadians, as the Elysians have some decent advantages over their standard guard counterparts, paying a pretty cheap price for the ability to be able to drop in anywhere on the map. This can mean that you can have guardsmen squads appearing from nowhere, punishing the enemy with massive amounts of first rank fire, second rank fire, or jumping out of a flight of Valkyries. Their gameplay is fairly similar to the Scions, and does suffer from some of the similar weaknesses, in that they'll generally be a lot stronger being allies to a main guard force, and unfortunately air cavalry isn't one of the strongest ways to play guard right now. 
There's also a little bit of a question mark as to whether or not Games Workshop will continue to support their rules whenever they do get round to rewriting the Forge World Imperial Guard regiments. They don't sell the miniatures anymore, and that might mean that we don't see any new rules for these guys in the future. Finally, we come to the Death Corps of Krieg, a guard regiment with a distinct World War I feel. Krieg was an isolated Imperial world that spent half a millennium fighting an unrelenting civil war against its own people who attempted to rebel and break away from Imperial ties. The war was eventually won by the use of nuclear weapons that devastated the planet's ecosystem, and it took a very long time to rebuild Krieg society. Despite never having aid from the Imperium in this long civil war, the Kriegsmen resolutely answered the call to provide new regiments, notably seeing conflict in the Siege of Rax, an Imperial hive world that have fallen to Chaos forces. The Krieg way of war focuses on pounding artillery barrages and resolutely advancing infantry that perform their duty regardless of enemy fire. They have many sappers and demolition experts amongst their number to better breach enemy lines, and they're not averse to using chemical weapons should the situation become necessary. The Krieg are routinely equipped with gas masks and respirators to help them survive in toxic environments. As well as artillery, Krieg are well known for their death rider formations, and on genetically modified Terran horses to the point where they barely resemble their ancestor. Almost hairless with shrunken tails and unstable physiology and clawed feet, these creatures are far more accustomed to the shock of the battlefield and can survive crippling injuries while still performing their duty. Overall, the Krieg way of war focuses on grimly pushing forwards in atonement for past wrongs. Now the Krieg have one of the better supported ranges out of the Imperial Guard regiments, they come from Forge World and are well supported with a good number of resin kits. They're very well detailed and I personally think look very nice indeed. Unfortunately, being Forge World, the prices of these guys are absolutely astronomical. For example, a five horse squad of Death Riders setting you back £75, which I think is a big factor in why you don't see quite as many armies of Krieg on the table. In game, they have a decent amount of their own unique units and war gear options, and their standard infantry are a little better in close combat, while not running away half as easily to enemy fire. Unfortunately, they haven't really held up too well in 8th edition at the moment, just because they haven't been updated at all since it came out with the Forge World indexes. Though Games Workshop has at some point in the future promised to re-release the Forge World rules, which should see a decent update for the Krieg forces, I would likely give them a decent competitive edge on the field. There's no real saying exactly how soon this will be, though. So I think that about wraps it up for the main regiments of the Imperial Guard. I know there are many more out there, including the Praetorians and the Tanith, and many, many more besides. The galaxy is a big place after all. But we have covered a fair number of them in one video. Overall, in terms of miniatures, the Cajun and the Kastchans are by far the most easy to collect, and there's certainly nothing to stop you applying the other regiment's rules as your own successor regiment to a Cajun themed force or something to better represent your own regiment's tactics. If you've got any insights as to why you prefer any of these regiments one over another, then let me know down in the comments below. It's certainly been good fun to have a good look into the lore of each one. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where we have regular 40k content coming out every day, usually of a more tactics and strategy related nature. If you'd like to support the channel, I do have a Patreon page, where you can find the link down in the description below. Making these videos does take quite a lot of time, this one itself has taken well over 5 hours. So if you are watching regularly and are enjoying, any support you can spare to help support the creation of more is greatly appreciated. And a big thank you to my current Patreons for making this channel possible. In any case, a big thank you for listening, and I hope to see you guys next time.